Greetings once again, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here, and we are going to finally start talking about how to find the value of a limit when you don't necessarily have a graph to rely on and when you don't necessarily have a table or a calculator handy for that matter. And I like to affectionately call these the green light limits. And they're actually going to be quite easy, and I think you're going to have a pretty easy time with them. So we're talking about topic 1.6 from the course and exam description, of course, and we're dealing with this idea here about the limit as x approaches some value. Well, in order to make this a little bit more clear, we're going to really need to focus in on three very important limit rules. And I'm going to call these our basic limit rules. And as you can see, there are three of them. We're going to let b and c be real numbers and let n be some positive integer. Well, the limit of b as x approaches c is equal to b. And that might seem pretty intuitive, but for a lot of reasons, the, the, the limit itself can get kind of confusing to students. And mainly it's because of all these letters that are dancing around and the fact that the limit idea is kind of new to a beginning calculus student. So I'm going to show you some really good concrete graphical examples of each of these rules that might make this sink in just a little bit. If you take a look at basic rule number two, it says the limit as x as x approaches c is equal to c. And then we have the limit as x approaches c of x to the nth power is the same as c to the nth power. Again, these three rules are going to really guide the way that we're going to find our limits in a very algebraic or analytic fashion. But before we start with our examples, let's break these three rules down graphically. All right, and here we go. I'm taking a look at the TI Inspire graphing calculator, and I've taken a moment to place the graphs of each of these three functions into my graph entry screen. And we're going to take a look at what uh, the findings are. So our first function, we're going to call it f of x, and that's equal to the b. And we're, we're sort of proposing that the limit of b as x approaches c is going to be b. So if you see the location of my c right here, that's going to stay constant. And I have the point located on my line. And hopefully you all realize that this is indeed a horizontal line. If I control my slider, I can let my value of b be pretty much anything. I've got it set to, to be some value somewhere between, say, negative 5 and 5, so it sits on the screen. But do you see that the value of that c, that x position, is just going to translate to be whatever y value we have on our curve, right? You have a horizontal line. Your limits are always about the journey and not the destination. Well, the journey is just the value of b. So no matter what x I have on this graph as I approach the c, the y value is always going to be the same every time. And in the case here, 2. Now, if we look at the second rule, the second one is a little bit different because our function, I'm going to call it g of x is equal to x. And that is a diagonal line that has a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of 0. Well, here I don't have to control any sliders at all. All I have to do is look, let me see, right there at that point, that black point right there. And I can say that the limit of uh, this function, which I'm going to change this a little bit because we have actually a different function, the limit of x as x approaches c according to this particular model is supposed to be c. And indeed, that's going to be the case. Because no matter where I decide to put this point, and let's see if I can move myself out of the way, take a look, move this point along, Whatever the x value is, the y value is exactly the same. This graph is nice, smooth, and continuous, so there's no reason for me to believe that the y value will be anything but what the x value is approaching there. So we've got that. Now if we look at our third example here, now in this particular guy, we've got a much more interesting function. We have x to the n that I'm going to call h of x. Now again, if I apply my slider here, I can see that my graph takes on a little bit of a different look every time I'm hitting that slider, all the way up to the fifth power. And if I keep hitting it, it kind of looks a little bit different. And 
I can take it all the way back to, say, a first degree. Well, again, what I want you all to notice is that no matter what we approach on the C value, that point is going to stick to our curve and it's going to take on whatever the Y value would be on that curve. And that Y value would just simply be C to the nth power. So by and large, because we have these wonderful continuous functions, finding these particular limits are really as easy as replacing the X value that you see in the function with the value C. Now that's gonna go a long way for us to find these green light limits. So with all that being said, let's return to the document and take a look at these four really quick examples. So in our example number one, it says that we want to find the limit as X approaches three of five. So we look at this and we say, well, really that's just a direct adaptation of our first rule. And so there's really not much to think about. The limit is going to equal this value of five. And now it's really important that we understand as soon as you apply a limit rule, the limit is sort of used up. It sort of disappears, it disintegrates. You don't wanna write the limit anymore. You don't wanna say that the limit as X approaches three is equal to five because that doesn't really make a lot of sense because I'm gonna ask you all, well, what are you taking the limit of? So try to avoid using notation like that. We're just allowed to write the numerical value. Over in example two, well, for this one right here, I, I guess when you take a look at this guy, it, it, it has a little bit more going on than say example four over here. But the idea is that you can use the same limit rules that we talked about in our previous lesson. We have a rule that says you are allowed to break up the sum of limits by using two separate limit statements. The limit of 4x squared as x approaches 2 plus the limit of 3 as x approaches 2. Now remember, this can only be done if you're guaranteed that each of those two limits exist. And I think we're in pretty good shape for these two guys existing. Why do I say that? Well, we can use an idea, again, from a previous lesson that says that the four constant can come out in front of the limit because the constant multiple rule allows for that to happen. And then meanwhile, we're kind of being patient over here with this limit of three as X approaches two. And by the time we get to here, we can use property number three and property number one simultaneously. The four in front sits and waits. The two plugs in for the X, we square, we get four. And then of course the limit of a constant is just the constant. And so 16 plus three is gonna be nine. Now, by and large, a student, at least in my class, is not obligated to write any of those steps. You can just simply plug the two in for the original X and do the arithmetic in your head and whip out the answer 19. Take a look at example three. We said that this limit process is pretty darn easy as long as we have nice behavior with our function. And I know you look at number three and you think, oh, okay, wait a minute, we have a denominator. Denominators cause trouble. But I don't think we're going to have to worry about that denominator here. And the reason is because our X value is approaching one. Yes, while it's true that X equaling negative one is going to cause problems for this, we're not even anywhere close to negative one. Our X is on a journey to become positive one. And so that's all that we have to focus on. We could easily plug one in for all of these X's and it will give us a numerical value. And all we need to do is, if need be, simplify that numerical value, six over two in this case, and lo and behold, we have our limit. And then finally, if you take a look at example four, it's a trigonometric example, of course, but as long as you're allowed to replace the X with what your X is approaching, and get some kind of a numerical value that makes sense. You've got to avoid things that don't make sense. What's something that doesn't make sense? Zero divided by zero. That's what not make, doesn't make sense. And you're going to see some of those in the next series of videos. Now, in this particular case, if you want to simplify this, the value would, of course, be one. And now we have our three, I'm sorry, our four examples taken care of. 
of our green light limits. And that's what I call a green light limit. If you are able to plug the X value in for the function and evaluate to get a numerical answer, you all have a green light. Now, is everything in the world a green light? No, it's not. And as we can see in the examples coming up in the next video, we have functions that might not behave so, let's say, nicely. And so stay tuned for that series of videos and we can teach you how to change that red light into a green light. I hope this helps. We'll see you next time and keep studying your calculus.